Welcome to Impact Makers Radio, helping you to find jargon-free information before choosing a professional to help solve your problems and live the life you love. And here's your host, Stuart Andrew Alexander. Hi and welcome everyone. Welcome to another Let's Talk Divorce Conversation. And during this segment of the show, I have divorce mediator Stephen Unruh, owner of Unruh Mediation of Pasadena, and he's calling in all the way from sunny Pasadena in California. Now, Stephen, who is considered to be somewhat of an authority in the area of divorce mediation, will be talking to you today about a very interesting topic. You see, Stephen's taken the time out of his very busy schedule to come and speak to us about the topic of can you change your spouse? So if you are one of the increasing number of people in the Pasadena, California area, and you feel that you, yeah, today's topic is of relevance to your situation and you're out there looking for jargon free information to address your divorce related problems then you might just want to take a break, log out of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or anything else you happen to be doing which may cause a distraction and get ready to take some copious notes as we listen in to what Stephen has to share with us today. So with that said, let's not keep him waiting a moment longer. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Thank you, Stuart. It's great to be here. You are so welcome, Stephen. So before we get started uh, with the heart of the interview today, it goes without saying that anything you share with us is not legal advice or legal assistance. It's purely for the purpose of disseminating general information. Now, could you just take a moment for me, Stephen, and just expand on that in your own words so everybody out there who's listening in is absolutely clear about what we're doing today? Yes, what I'm about is, in, in this show, is educating individuals concerning mediation. Uh, part of We're going to look at a couple of different myths, but it's not disseminating any kind of legal advice. It's being supportive information that I think can be very practical in its use. Well, thanks for making that very clear then, Steve. So my first question that I have for you today then is, can you just please tell us a little bit about Unruh Mediation of Pasadena? the people who you serve, and the kinds of situations that they find themselves in when they initially reach out to you for help. Sure. On remediation, I work with couples that are divorcing. A lot of times, one of the spouses is against it. Probably half of my cases, one spouse is um, angry about it, doesn't believe in divorce, doesn't think you should be getting a divorce. And so I work with high-conflict couples where one of them has chosen to get a divorce. You can't stop that in the state of California. If someone wants to be divorced, they will eventually get divorced. And so I work with couples where there's a lot of resistance going on and usually a lot of blaming where one partner makes the other person completely at fault for the entire failure of the marriage. So Stephen, when you think about the people you help, those people you just described to us, what are the advantages of them knowing that they cannot change their spouse? Well, in a situation where people are thinking and talking about getting a divorce, oftentimes, I'm also a licensed psychotherapist. And as a psychotherapist, I've been in the field of psychology for three decades. So when I help people go through divorce, I look at the issues, um, maybe whether there's addictions in this marriage, whether there's personality uh, traits that are harming the situation. But so often, one of the spouses thinks that they can keep going back into counseling and get more and more counseling, and eventually they'll save the marriage. And honestly, there's just times that counseling doesn't work. I think that's a myth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, that's that's a great insight and actually a good segue into my next question for you then, Steve. Um, Okay. What do you feel are some of the biggest myths that are out there when it comes to the way how people think that they can change their spouse? What are some of the myths around that? Well, one of, the, one of the myths would be that you can change your spouse, when in reality, you really can't. The individual has to want to change, but not only that, they actually have to see the value of changing. So there's times if somebody, let's say, has more of a narcissistic bent to their personality, they're going to have difficulty admitting they're wrong. They're going to have difficulty 
um, taking blame and especially even taking responsibility for things that they've said or done. They tend to push that off and excuse or blame their mother or the government or whoever they possibly can. And the spouse married to someone like that tends to think that if they find the right therapist or if they work hard enough or if they keep sort of dancing the dance of changing, that this person will improve. But some people who are fairly narcissistic don't think they need to change. They think everyone else around them should change. And that's what um, creates an enormous amount of stress in a marriage and often leads to divorce. So, Stephen, in your day-to-day practice, when people come to you for your help, I'm sure they come with all kinds of preconceived notions of what they believe to be true. Um, Maybe they've heard something from a friend or a work colleague, or they've gone online and done some research and believe that the things that they have found is 100% true. And especially when it comes to the, the legal industry itself or the industry that you work in. So with that said, then, can you just share one or two common misconceptions around the um, legal industry for us, please, Steve? Yes. Excellent. That's a great question, because so often people think that they're going to get fair representation if they go to court, if they fight in court. And that's not often that's actually just not the case. You might, of course, if you hire an attorney and you litigate and you fight your divorce out in court, you're going to be represented by your attorney. But You don't know always what they're sharing with the other attorney, how they're fighting and how they keep a divorce going on and on and on. I have had so many situations where after the divorce, when people went to court, they said, I didn't feel represented. I don't know what was being communicated. So one of the misconceptions is that you're going to somehow have more power if you have an attorney. And that's not the case. Mediation actually gives you a greater sense of authority and a greater sense of impacting the situation because you're being heard. You're right in the same room and you have a voice and the mediator requires the other party to hear you and to listen to what the specific issues are. And you you don't get that when you litigate. So that's a misconception that people think somehow they will have more power if they go to court. And I, I disagree with that. And I think um, uh, you know another misconception is that if you are going to mediate that you need to have an amicable uh, divorce. You've kind of get, got to get along and kind of care about the other person and you don't really want to get a divorce. So you want to mediate and not, and not fight it out in court. Whereas oftentimes, uh, and that's true, you can mediate, but I also work with high conflict couples. So one misconception is that to mediate, you have to be getting along. And I would say, no, you can mediate almost no matter what. There are a few times mediation does not work. And that would be if there's um, uh, severe violence or if there's severe addictive addictions going on that are that are very destructive. But otherwise, nine out of 10 times, even high conflict, very angry people, generally you can mediate. And I encourage people to try mediation first because it saves them so much time and money. So, Stephen, we're talking about um, you cannot change your spouse. That's your topic for today. So with that in mind, then, Steve, what are some of your clients' most common fears around today's topic? Yeah, I think one of the fears around this topic would be that if they were to move ahead with a divorce, that they wouldn't be able to tolerate the loneliness. So sometimes that's a fear clients have, that if I actually get a divorce, I'll, I'll, I'll be worse off. And, you know, I, I can't exactly say if that's true or not for them, but if they're getting support and if they're getting the care that they need, um, you know, depending upon the kind of situation they're in, I think that's an unrealistic fear. Um, now, I, also, there's a fear sometimes people have that a divorce will just ruin their kids' lives. But I see kids as resilient, and I think that if we give them security and if we're affirming Uh, And if we don't uh, triangulate them, you know, if we don't bring them into our problems, it doesn't mean that their lives are going to be ruined. Now, specifically related to this topic, though, of, of, um, of the fears that we have in trying to change your spouse, that I think some of those fears are abated when you realize that you can't. We don't have the power to change other people. We could force them to kind of maybe obey us but their attitudes are still going to be the same. And so I think that when they get a divorce, they're afraid maybe of how their kids will be treated with that other spouse. 
And, you know, sometimes that's a fear that really has to be tackled in mediation, that they recognize maybe this other spouse has anger issues and they haven't changed. How are they going to deal with that if they have the kids under their care? And that's a very legitimate concern. And that has to be really handled in mediation. And I think if you're a therapist, I have the skill to be able to do that as a therapist also. Okay, Steve. So you essentially introduced the elephant into the room. So let, let's address okay. that. Um, how can they get past those fears then? Well, one of the ways to get past those fears is if their mediator is able with the other party there, if they're more psychologically savvy, what I do is I educate them about the impact on the children if they're not, uh, if, if they have issues that have not been dealt with appropriately. So in other words, if someone has said to a spouse, and they could be male or female, it, it's really equal, very, anger is very equal among gender. And if someone's been saying, you have anger problems, you have anger issues, the kids are afraid of your anger, you're always angry. That is a sign. <laughs> those, all those messages should be clear signs that you have problems with anger. So as a mediator and a therapist, what I explain to people is that the fighting that goes on and the anger that continues after a divorce can actually be the most harmful things to kids, even more, much more so than going through the divorce. And that's what the research now that's coming out talks about. After a divorce, the longer it lingers, the anger goes on, the triangulating, the blaming the kids, the scapegoating, as that continues after a divorce, the research shows it's very, very detrimental to kids. And so to alleviate that fear, I take a lot of time in my mediation and I educate people about that. And I talk about um, if they have those issues, how they need to be addressed. That just because they're getting a divorce doesn't mean your anger goes away. If you're an angry person, you're going to find other things to be angry about. You know, Steve, uh, <clears throat> one of the reasons why I started this series, Let's Talk Divorce, is to invite professionals like yourself on here who share such great insights like you just shared with us. Because I can only just underpin what you said about the, the longer, um, you know, the longer things go on after the divorce, the longer negative things go on after the divorce, the, 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 you know, the more impact that has on, on the children themselves. Because I myself, I was, a, I, I was a child of divorce, Steve. Um, my okay. parents went through a very bloody, violent, volatile, lots of conflict. And I was only eight, nine years old when that happened in front of my uh -huh. very own yeah. eyes. And I didn't have the capability to, to be able to process that. So I ended up carrying the guilt of it, thinking it was all my yeah. fault, right? As, yeah. as you do as a yeah. young child. And right. I carried that guilt on my little shoulders throughout my teenage years, into my young adult years, into my 30s and my 40s. And it wasn't until very late on in life, I'm in my mid-50s now, that I actually started to look into how I could cope you know what what tools could i um develop to be able to cope with the fallout of my parents divorce because as you know when things happen as a child they still affect what you do today as an adult now yes. what you just said in terms of you know the longer it, the, the the conflict goes on after the divorce is just so true because i remember with my parents when mm -hmm. they did eventually I mean, even the run up to the divorce was horrendous there was lots of fighting mm -hmm. and it wasn't until my father actually moved out and <laughs> he moved to the top of the road with his with his fancy lady <laughs> which didn't help either because <laughs> wow, wow. i was always seeing him there um but it wasn't right. until he moved out um that things I thought things that were going to, going to get better, but they didn't because if they were literally on top of each other, you know, crossing paths um, as we got, went about their daily daily business. And there was always this conflict there. There was always this, your father's this, your father's that. Mm. And when I saw my mother, vice versa, and you're caught up in the middle as a child playing this yeah, ping pong right. game. And that went on for years and had a had a massive impact on my yeah. psyche as a young child right. and as a young man. You know, I was yeah. um, just to give the, the listeners examples out there, just the, the kind of um, uh, influence that it can have I mean, at school. I was the, right. the, 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 the model student, right? I was the school captain, mm -hmm. you know, the soccer captain, as you guys call it, soccer, football, we call it in England. Uh -huh. I was the captain um, all the way through primary school, all the way through high school. I was in the cricket team. I was a prefect in school. And all the teachers always used to say to the bad kids, hey, look at Stuart Alexander. Why can't you be like him? However, when it came to my exams, I used to flop. I always used to fail mm. exams. 
And I never understood at that time why. And it was only until later on in life when I really started to to examine what was what really went on in my early days that I yeah, you know, then I came to learn. I was just really acting out the things which I saw playing out in front of me on a daily basis with my mother calling right. my father a failure. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, he's a family show, so I'm not going to use the kind of words that I was exposed to. Right. <laughs> but, you know, and, right. and, and then being caught up in the middle of that, sometimes being the brunt of the anger, of the frustration, of the anxiety mm-hmm. that my parents felt and being, you know, when my father, in my father's absence, being that person who was being called the names Instead of my father, which I didn't understand right. at that time as yeah. a young child, yeah. right? So it has a massive impact on you. So, you know, the reason why I'm just spending a little bit of time and stealing a little bit of your light right now is just to share things from my perspective of an adult who has been through that, what you mentioned in terms of um, the the fallout, you know, how long it, the, right. the, the process still goes on. Yeah. What a, a negative impact it can have now. Yeah. I've I've come out Absolutely. on the good side of it, right? I know kids who are in similar situations who turn to crime, drugs, self-harming. I was fortunate, you know, I ended up joining the military and ran away from it all and um, and kind of, quote, unquote, rescued myself from it. And yeah. today right. I'm able to do a show like this and invite people on like yourself in the hope that, you know, what the, through the insights that you're sharing, that the listeners mm-hmm. out there will hopefully just look at things if they're in a similar situation where there's lots of conflict you know hopefully they'll look at things differently and say hey you know Stephen is sharing some really great things here maybe we should put the kids first maybe we should communicate a lot better in front of the kids maybe as I love to say we should love our kids more than we hate ourselves at this particular moment so I'm so glad that you've come onto the show and you just spoke about that particular topic there this is just really so it rings home so true Well, that's such a powerful story that you shared, such a very painful one. Thank you for, for your honesty. You know, that the, the uh, difficulty here would be someone listening, and they would be saying to themselves, well, my spouse, he needs, she needs to be listening to this. I'm going to mm. record it for her. <laughs> right, know, that, right. That we want to we instantly hear something like this and project it onto the other person. Mm. But every one of us, you're so right, um, had, your, had, had your parents had enough of a sense to say to you, this is not about you, that this has nothing to do with you. And so when I work with couples that are divorcing, whatever ages their kids are, especially, you know, if they're under 20, I say, you've got to sit down and tell them, this is not about you. We love you. You're, you're not a part of this. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. And, and a couple different times, couples have said, oh, we don't need to do that. I go, yes, you do. Oh, they know that that's not their fault. No, nope, they don't. And sure enough, they'll come back and they'll say, well, we were shocked. My, even my 15 year old that we thought was such a brilliant, amazing daughter, she'd never blame herself. And she broke down crying, exactly. thinking that it was, that she was partly to blame because she, you know, had um, been kicked off um, her, her softball team. And she thought somehow that had caused distress in their marriage. So kids, they interpret things like you did, you know, we, we, we at that age don't have the resources to think, so abstractly that it's not our fault and parents need to communicate that. And then when it goes on, you're right. Your whole experience shows that the the conflict that went on further only brings more harm later on in life. And we've got to end the conflict and the fighting as quickly as possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. I I, I wholeheartedly agree 100% with everything you said, Stephen. Yeah. This is why I love speaking with mediators because, you know, in, even when my family did decide to get divorced, it was just straight, you know, litigation. And it was just, they went to the courts. And I remember, you know, my mom speaking about my dad's lawyer and him talking about my mother's lawyer. And there was even lots of conflict there. So the conflict never mm-hmm. stopped. And there was nobody yeah. speaking to myself or my brothers and my sisters yeah. about the whole process. Yeah. It was like we were just right. invisible. Right. It's what I like to call the invisible voices. And we were. We, yeah. we were just totally right. invisible. Um, maybe for some weird reason, my parents thought that we um, 
didn't pick up on what was happening. But as a child, and I can tell you right now, listeners out there, if you do have children and you do find yourself in that unfortunate position where there is conflict, if you think you can hide it from your children, you are so mistaken because they pick up right. on every right. single nuance. You cannot they hide do. it. So you it's best they just to it. speak about it like um, like yeah. Stephen has said, yes. Yeah, they do. They see the, the depression and, and the stress. You know, even in a case, um, and this happens a lot, but even in cases where I have, I mediate cases where people has, have also been divorced and they're still arguing and fighting about issues. And a case was so sad to me that, that um, it was very clear that when they had vacation, it was very clear how they were to communicate, that they weren't to triangle the kids. And, and such a simple experience of getting um, an extra day, just one extra day to go on a very special trip with a big family reunion in New York. And the other spouse just had a cow and fought it and threatened and called the police and did all these things. And I just thought, well, it, this was for a wonderful, important thing. Why would you do that? But that selfishness in some of these angry spouses is just so toxic and so contaminating that they're, they're just bringing such unhappiness into their children's lives because they can't give in because they can't maybe lose once in a while or give in or negotiate or, or, or allow something or allow themselves to not always get their way. And when we always demand our way, um, it, it, it affects our children in ways we'll never realize at the time. Absolutely. I mean, partners that you simply just have to realize or it would be wise to realize it's just better just to give up something of what you want yes, so that right, both right. of you can get you know something as opposed to just dog you know just like a pit bull with a with a dog in a with a bone in his, uh -huh. in his mouth and holding uh -huh. on doggedly to that bone and just not be prepared to shift and end up you end up getting nothing and then the, the children right. um, suffer suffer yeah. for that yeah they do they suffer yeah. when we can't when we're unwilling to give in um, for the better of their kids Absolutely. right that's so true so while we are speaking along the lines of um, mediation, it's still, even for all of its all of its good parts, Stephen, it's still not something that's top of mind um, with when people start looking at their options. You know, when they start considering their options for divorce, it's not something that the people immediately think about. Well, because the process mm -hmm. of mediation is still something which is quite new. But for those mm -hmm. that do think about it, for those who are aware of it, Stephen, what perceived obstacles or what are some of the perceived obstacles that are out there which might be preventing them from seeking the help of a divorce mediator like yourself? Okay. Well, I think one of the um, common um, obstacles that people have is that they, um, it could be that one of their spouses has already retained an attorney. So they immediately think that they have to do that, that they have to, you know, do tit for tat, that they have to also, you know, match them. And I've had cases where they've come in and said, well, he has this attorney and he's going to come after me. And I've said, let me call him. Let me reach out to him and give him a phone call and see if he can come into my office. You don't have to automatically get an attorney and jump through those hoops if he's willing to mediate. And so there's cases where um, I've been able to slow the other spouse down and to bring them into mediation. And I've said, so put your attorney on ice, put him on hold, tell them to not do any more discovery and that you're going to meet and you're going to, you know, mediate. And so you don't have to get rid of your attorney, but you can certainly put them on hold so that you're not wasting any money. Uh, you can also use them as a third eye. You can, you know, bring the judgment in the agreement to them and get their opinion, but we're still in the mediation process. So I try to have people not overreact just because a spouse has retained an attorney. And the other obstacle would be that if it, if it is a very difficult marriage and if it's been a difficult, somewhat, you know, narcissistic uh, spouse where they, you know, blame everyone, they don't take responsibility for their actions or their words, um, those are difficult to mediate, but you don't have to automatically go to court. I have worked with some very complicated cases. And I've, so sometimes what I'll do then is meet with the spouses individually, then I'll bring them together and then I'll meet with them individually and then bring them together at the end. And it's in those individual sessions, I can slow them down. I can help them see how they're impacting their kids. Um, and I can help them see how sometimes they're, um, I don't call it narcissism to their face. I'll call it stubbornness 
I'll say some of your stubbornness is really going to cost you more money. It's costing you more time. You're not willing to negotiate. You're not willing to look at what her, pers- what her side of the story is. And so I try to get them in mediation to think of why is the other person doing what they're doing? I try to get them out of their shoes and out of their perspective. And that's difficult with a narcissist, but sometimes you can still mediate even with um, some personality disorders. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, my guest today is divorce mediator Stephen Unruh, and he's here talking about the topic of you cannot change your spouse. Now, with that in mind, Stephen, and for those people who are listening in right now, what are some of the little but unknown pitfalls or even common mistakes that they need to be aware of no matter what kind of situation they find themselves in? Okay, great. Very good question. I think when you when someone is stuck thinking that they can change, oftentimes I've seen people go from therapist to therapist to therapist. And when, when someone comes in and, and they say, well, we're thinking of divorcing, we're not sure, but we thought we would try this one more time. Well, I'm number five. Oh, okay, I'm your fifth therapist in how many years? That's a sign. <laughs> That's a signal that, you know, someone has tried to go overboard and really work and work and work, you know, to try to save this marriage. And, and you can, you, you should try everything. But when you get to a point in which you've been going through all of these therapists, because the one spouse who is very resistant to changing keeps dumping them. He keeps, he keeps breaking up with these therapists and getting rid of them. When you start to look at what his own issues are or what her own issues are. And when you get close, sometimes they jump ship and they say, no, I don't like that therapist. Well, so one, one thing to be aware of is if that's happening over and over to me, it says you, you, Keep thinking you have the power to change your spouse. You have to step back and look at how much you've invested, how much time and energy you've put into this. And if that spouse doesn't think that they need to change, they don't need to do anything. It's all your fault. Well, unfortunately, then you're probably involved with a narcissist and you don't want to keep beating your head against the wall. You don't want to keep doing what's not working. And that is to find another therapist because you would you would just be on number six then. So, Stephen, how can those pitfalls be avoided then? Well, I think if you can meet with someone who actually recognizes what personality disorders are, then you recognize you've been, um, hopefully with a good therapist and a good mediator therapist, that you are um, kind of codependent. I know that's a term that's way, way, way overused. But you can stop, you can stop being Um, the co-narcissist in a way. You can stop being codependent. So what you have to do then is you have to, in a way, pull back emotionally and quit being so impacted by all of their irresponsibility. Very difficult to do. But what narcissists hate is when someone's ambivalent. They want either the rage or the love. They want the drama or they want the passion. But when you begin to pull away you, you're able to feel some sanity and you're not so wrapped up in their craziness. The second thing is you have consequences. So what you would do is you would say, you know, when you blow up and when you explode, I'm actually going to take the kids and leave and I'm going to be gone for a few days. So that's a consequence. And so what I'm saying to people who think that they can, they're caught up in trying to change their spouse, they need to back up and look at that behavior and instead recognize that um, almost the opposite, they need to start having consequences and follow through with those consequences when, um, you know, when someone is out of control or harming, you know, even verbally harming your children. You've, you've got to be able to have um, a clear pattern of, of um, a consequence for that behavior, just like we would if a kid was smoking at 10, we have a consequence. So with a spouse who is immature and childish and, and harming the home, you have to have a consequence. A silly one would be the man who never calls when he's late and he's always late and he never calls. Well, she starts to put the dinner away and it's a small gesture, but it's trying to save people from this behavior of always thinking that they can get their spouse to act differently. Really what you can do is only have a consequence. Right, right. So 
Stephen, without going into your backstory, because we're going to go into that in just a few short moments, but when you think about all of those people you've helped, all those clients you've helped throughout your career to achieve the transformation that they were looking for when they initially reached out to you, and I do emphasize the word transformation because essentially that's what you do. You're a transformationalist. You take people from point A when they initially reach out to you to point B to where they would, you know, where they desire to be. So when you think about all of those people then, Stephen, on a deep down personal level, what does it, what does it give you to be able to help them um, to create that transformation? What does that, what does that give you? How does it make you feel, Steve? It, it actually gives me a sense of accomplishment, a sense of fulfillment. Um, it gives me a sense that my life uh, matters, that I'm, I'm impacting people. Um, and it might not be millions of people, but I, I've raised three boys and I, I look at how, who they are today. Um, I went through a divorce and yet um, when they would fight, I would stop them and I would say, treat each other the way I treat you. And that's what they do today. They're loving, they're thoughtful, they're kind, because I had to model for them what I wanted them to do with each other. And, and so to me, if I was willing to be honest with myself and transform myself, um, then I needed to do that with my kids. And I'm, now, I, now that they're gone, I bring that into other families, other couples, other people that are going through a divorce. And I, I want to bring healing. And so it is, um, it's a good feeling. Absolutely. It's a, it's a sense of fulfillment. That's for sure. And I, and I, when, what I was going to say, when it, and when it comes part of the process of helping people transform, it's not, um, it's not just about myself, but it's helping them realize that the other person's not the enemy. They might feel like it, but if they can begin to pull away from that concept that it's all his or her fault, it's all them, they're the enemy, they're the bad one. When we get to a divorce, I encourage people to get out of that mindset because if they don't get out of that mindset, they're going to be divorced and still angry and unhappy. And so part of the transformation for them is to quit blaming that other person for what's going on in their lives. Well, thanks for sharing that with us, Stephen. I'm sure the listeners out there are going to find it very useful just to know a little bit about your own personal stories you know what you get from it how it makes you feel you know because it's, it's important for them to know that when they're you know thinking about reaching out and um and giving you a giving you a call so thanks for sharing that steve so let me ask you this then Stephen. um it's never a, a straight path to where one finds themselves in life today. It's always a winding, meandering path, okay? I'm sure you didn't wake up one day 20 years ago and say, hey, I want to be a divorce mediator and boom, you know, you cut right, your fingers right, right. And, and, and you was a divorce mediator. No, certainly right. not. Well, you're reminding so, me of, of the Beatles, the long and winding <laughs> road. Is that what there you're you saying? go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. So with that in mind then, Steve, Please share with us, you know, what's your backstory? What led you to becoming the divorce mediator that you are today? Well, that's a good question. Um, I grew up in the Midwest, and my dad was a minister, and I was a, the middle child. And so I think what happened in that family dynamic, my parents were not very close. They weren't very affectionate. And I think with the struggles that went on in our family, I felt invisible. Uh, And in a way, by being invisible, it also kept me out of trouble. However, it's not a fun place to be when you're invisible. And so I think part of my journey in mediation is that I'm impacting people. I'm not invisible. I'm helping them resolve an issue. I'm helping them get through a difficult, maybe ugly divorce um, as as, um, amicable as, as possible. And so it feels... Um, effective. I feel effective in that. And so it, it's clearly, my career is clearly the opposite of being invisible. And I'm, so I'm certain that being a middle child had some impact on that. I think seeing the lack of communication, I went into psychology, I went into speaking and radio. And so I learned how to communicate. Um, that, that impacted me and, uh, and my desire, um, my desire to create change. Um, my parents were agents of change in their own respective fields. And I think that did model something positively for me is to be an agent of change. So when you think back on your career then, um, Stephen, 
Can you just please share a lesson that you may have learned early on that still influences how you do business today? Hmm. I think the issue of honesty is really important. Having integrity, because your reputation is really what you have. Uh, and, when, and if that goes downhill, um, you know, you're, you're in quite a bit of trouble and you have to start all over again to build your reputation back up. Um, and so I think when I was an intern, the uh, program director who ran our clinic um, was doing financially very well. <laughs> it was a very successful clinic. And I remember all of us were complaining about some of the furniture. Some people had chairs that were really inadequate and our boss um, at the time told us that there was not enough money to replace those chairs. So while he was on vacation, uh, the secretary who was planning on leaving um, divulged the budget and actually showed all of us on staff that there was lots of money. There was plenty of money in the kitty for all of us to get new chairs and to feel comfortable. Um, of course, she lost her job for that. But, but um, uh, you know, we it was just such a story for me to realize that you need to take care of your people. You need to take care of your staff and that honesty um, is really key in terms of maintaining your reputation. So that had an impact on me and I was an intern at the time. Sure. Sure. Um, again, just as a reminder, today's topic is you cannot change your spouse. Now with that in mind then, Stephen, what's the most important question that people out there should be asking themselves while they're thinking about today's topic? I think that that's a great question. And I think the answer would be, do I have empathy? Does my spouse have empathy? You see, Part of, the, part of the theme of today's show, I think, has been having empathy and how we impact our kids versus narcissism, versus what you went through in your home and the pain that occurred and your parents didn't even consider how you were impacted with all of the craziness and, and the volatility that went on. And so when I look at couples who think that they can somehow have the power to change their spouse. They have to pull back, they have to step back, and they have to ask themselves, does my spouse have empathy? And if they don't, they're, they're kind of stuck, and they don't need to keep trying to change them because you cannot force a person to have empathy. They have to have it in themselves. And I think then asking ourselves that question, do I have empathy? How am I impacting my home? How are my children affected by my words and my behavior? Am I putting my spouse down? Am I insulting them? And how, if I am, how is that affecting and harming my kids? Because it's con creating confusion and it's forcing them to pick sides, which is completely unfair. Kids don't have the wherewithal to handle that kind of pressure. Now, Stephen, we're, we're, you're coming towards the end of the show, but before we wrap things up, I've got a couple more questions for you. Now, as I've already alluded to before, I'm a fan of divorce mediation. I love the, the, the process, the, the whole concept of mediation. So with that said then, Stephen, and for those listeners out there who are listening in right now, what's the most important thing that people should be considering when evaluating a divorce mediator? You know, I think the most important thing is really their number of years in mediation, their number of years in the field. And I might add, uh, because I think experience does count for something. Certainly we know those, those individuals who maybe have been, you know, a, a teacher forever and ever and ever, and doesn't mean they're a good teacher. But I do think years of experience is an important factor. And I think if that person has had training in psychology, by and large, most mediators don't. They either become a mediator because they go into that field, or they can be an attorney and they've been trained in law and they become a mediator. But if you can find a mediator that actually has a background in psychology, uh, that's very important. So you cannot change your spouse. That's what we've been talking about today, ladies and gentlemen. So if there is somebody out there who feels that they need to know more about today's topic, then uh, Steve, what would be the best way for them to get in touch with you? Well, they could certainly go to my website and um, I'll give you, it's my name, stephenunruh.com and uh, Stephen with a V and then unruh is U-N-R-U-H. So it's U-N-R-U-H. 
U-H, stephenunruh.com. That's the easiest way to reach me. And I will respond very quickly, whether people call me. My phone number is on the email, is on the website. People can call or email me. Either way is fine. So would you just care to share that phone number, Steve? Because not everybody listening may have um, immediate access to the internet. So go ahead, please. Okay, great. It's 818-523-5723. That's 818. And then it's 523 523- 5723. And that is my phone number. And I'm more than happy to take phone calls. Now that you've shared your phone number, there may still be one or two people who are sat on the fence and thinking, hmm, this Stephen Unruh, he sounds like he knows what he's doing. He shared lots of great insights. I'd really like to know more, but what's on the other side of that phone call, if I pick up the phone, what's my risk? What's going to happen? What's his process? These are all the things that people are thinking when they, you know, they're told, yeah, call 5555 for more information <laughs> and for a free consultation. <laughs> right. So what I'd like to do, Stephen, right, because yeah. people out there want to know if you're waiting for them with the Fred Flintstone Club to hit them over the head and sell them everything <laughs> underneath the sun, right? So right. let's eliminate that risk. And please just walk people through what will happen when they pick up the phone and send and, and give you a call? Right. Something very simple. They get my voicemail message and I call them back within 24 hours. And I don't have um, a whole bunch of CDs or videos that I sell. I don't do that. I simply um, call them. I ask, their, I ask questions about their current situation. And I, um, I see if it's an appropriate situation for me to be involved in. And we set up an appointment and sit down. Now, sometimes people have called from different parts of the country, and so we'll have to set up an appointment through Skype. But it's a conversation in which I listen, I ask questions, they talk to me, they get me, they don't get my secretary, and we go from there. Okay, folks, that's all we have time for today. The time has just flown by so quickly, Stephen. Um, it, it just feels like we're just getting warmed up and we have to go, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> It does. I've enjoyed it very much, Stuart. Thank you for allowing me to be a guest on your show. You're so welcome, Steve. So let me take a moment just to remind everybody again that we have been listening to divorce mediator Stephen Unruh. Thank you so much for sharing so generously with us today, Stephen. You have certainly demonstrated that you are a true educator, advocate, and trustworthy advisor for your client's success. So thank you so much, Stephen. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate it. You are so welcome, my friend. And I'd also like to take a quick moment to say a big thank you to you. Yes, to our listener. You're out there in the Pasadena, um, California area. Um, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day. Yes, we do appreciate that you are busy too. But thank you for joining us on this what I can only describe as a very insightful and informative discussion with one of the leading divorce mediators in Pasadena, California today. Again, his name is Stephen Unruh. Make sure you do check him out. Give him a call. He explained he's not going to hit you over the head with a Fred Flintstone club. <laughs> he's quite friendly. Okay. Um, visit his website. There are some really good resources on there. Um, you know, at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, whatever you do decide to do, after listening to Stephen today, I am absolutely sure that you're going to be in good hands. So that's it, folks. Again, my name is Stuart Andrew Alexander. I'm a long lost, distant relative of the British royal family, but they don't tell anybody about that. Can you imagine that, Stephen? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, that's just Shocking. Just shocking yeah. Yeah. I'm the darkest, <laughs> darkest secret. That Prince Charles, Prince Charles is a naughty boy, I tell you. But anyway, <laughs> once again, Stuart Andrew Alexander, and we'll be back shortly with some more leading divorce mediation professionals in this, our series of Let's Talk Divorce Conversations. So, until then, take care, have a great day, and we'll talk real soon. Thank you for tuning in to Impact Makers Radio. To listen to all past, present, and future industry thought leaders and trendsetters, visit us at impactmakersradio.com.